A very good afternoon to everyone and uh, welcome to a historic panel. Uh, this is historic because to the best of our knowledge, a dedicated panel on the future of militaries has never ever taken place in the World Economic Forum. So you're present at creation, first but not the last. You will have seen um, from the program that we put much more emphasis this year on uh, geopolitics, international security, and the phenomenon of geoeconomics, which is the intersection between uh, uh, global political change and global economic change. That's no coincidence because we have uh, just lived through a year that uh, many has described as a geopolitical annus horribilis. We have seen both an uh, exacerbation of um, uh, problems related to asymmetric threats like the growth of the Islamic State in, uh, in the Middle East. But we also see in the return of strategic competition between key players, for instance, over the conflict in Ukraine. Just to remind the audience that exactly a year ago when we were ending uh, Davos, there were political troubles in Ukraine, but no fighting. So all of that has happened over the last year. Uh, and uh, likewise, in many parts of the world, we're seeing a world that is uh, more conflictual than it has been in a long time. So that's a major theme in many panels. And I see many people who have attended other panels in the same vein. Now, this panel is on the future of militaries. So it's on the implication of these broader geopolitical security trends on the military profession and on military choices and on military leadership and on the leadership of those entrusted with overseeing how militaries are uh, run, uh, prepared, trained, how investments are made. And that's the part of it which uh, is uh, innovative to the World Economic Forum. But uh, so far, the impression has been that uh, this is an area uh, in which there's a lot of interest uh, in many of our communities because these things um, intersect with each other in completely new ways. We have a remarkable panel here uh, this afternoon. We have uh, people with uh, live experience from uh, conflicts, some of them ongoing in their own country. Uh, to start with the uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Iraq, uh, Mr. Rosh Shavas. Uh, who has a distinguished political career uh, in Iraq, but who has also been commander of the Peshmerga. And the Peshmerga are among those who are on the front line in the battle against IS on the ground. Others are in the air, they are on the ground in the battle against the Islamic State. Um, we have um, uh, Minister Pinzon Bueno, uh, the, uh, um, uh, Juan Carlos Pinzon Bueno, who is Minister of National Defense of Colombia. Uh, another country who hopefully is on its way out of an uh, internal military conflict that has been going on for, I guess, long before you were born. Not only because you're a young man, but also because the conflict has been going on for a long time. Uh, very, look very much forward to hear your perspectives. Professor Joe Nye, uh, renowned uh, thinker on uh, uh, hard security, soft security, no, sorry, hard power, soft power and smart power but also uh, somebody with a background from uh, military leadership as he has been Assistant Secretary of Defense in the US during the Clinton administration. Uh, um, Ambassador Wolfgang Ischinger, uh, who uh, again, a long distinguished career in German diplomacy, now head of the Munich Security Conference, which is uh, upcoming in a couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, Vice Admiral Kurt Tidd, uh, who is um, Assistant to the Chairman of Joint Chief of Staff, and represent the uh, American uh, military, has also been here uh, with uh, uh, Secretary Kerry, and we very much appreciate that you were able to stay on and be with us in this panel. Uh, so that's the cast, um, and I would like to start maybe with uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, also because you are, as we said, that uh, battlefront. What lessons for the future of the militaries, and the present, of course, in your case, are you drawing from what's going on right now in the Battle of IS that the rest of us would like to learn something about? Well, first of all, I have to uh, speak frankly about the situation in Iraq. Uh, certainly, we, we are facing many challenges. The most important challenges are tackling the, the terrorism, the fight which is going on in Iraq. The humanitarian problems which we had, we had to deal with a huge number of refugees, almost two million people inside Iraq. Some of them are from Syrian, other are internal uh, people uh, 
from the areas of Mosul, Tikrit, uh, Amba, Samara, the Sunni regions especially. And beside the other challenges, which are mainly the heritage of the previous dictator, dictator uh, regime of Saddam Hussein. Uh, beside all of that, the main problem in Iraq now is the uh, oil prices. Because of the low oil prices, the budget of the uh, of the the Iraqi budget is lower to uh, to mostly about sixty percent. Now we have to deal with with 40% of the revenues which were awaited for, for this year. So this means in general that Iraq to tackle the terrorism very effectively needs uh, economic help. This is one of, of, of the main uh, realities in Iraq. Secondly, the Iraqi security forces, especially after the collapse in, in June 2014, in Mosul, the Iraqi army and the police, police uh, forces, all they need to be reorganized from the beginning, reoriented, and equipped. Uh, their main duty is to be, uh, to be successful, to gain victory against the, the, uh, against the uh, terrorists. I don't want to, to, to call them the Islamic State because they are not an Islamic State. They are terrorists in general. And <clears throat> the militias who are working and supporting the uh, uh, Iraqi government in this moment, they have also to be controlled through the governmental institutions and uh, put in line with the benefit of the country uh, in the direction of, uh, of helping to achieve reconciliation and, and a mutual understanding among the, the component of the Iraqi community. Uh, beside all of that, the Iraqi security institutions, they have to cooperate much, much better with the Peshmerga forces who are fighting uh, in the north. And at the same time, they have to coordinate with the uh, alliance with the coalition forces and uh, take benefit from the opportunity that there are a lot of people who are trying to, helping, to help them and train them. In Kurdistan, the Peshmerga are fighting very severely, but they are effective. Uh, it is not an exaggeration if I say the only force who have gained some, some victory against uh, Daesh people, against the terrorists, and has broken their magic that they are undefeatable, they are defeatable. Um, and the Peshmerga has uh, approved that. The Peshmerga now is very close to Mosul, but alone they cannot enter, enter Mosul because of many reasons. First of all, Mosul is an urban center. Uh, it has to be studied very carefully how to deal with the problem of such a large city, how to deal with the such a population center. And at the same time, Mosul is a center of the Sunni Arab people. And <coughs> this might, when the Peshmerga alone tries to, to attack Mosul or try to, to free Mosul then, uh, alone without the, the cooperation of the Arab Sunnis and the, without the cooperation of the Iraqi armies, this is almost impossible. Uh, Besides all of that, the Peshmerga, they are still not very good equipped. They have some help. These are some weapons, some ammunition. But if you really want to tackle the terrorism, you need a real army in the region. And the Peshmerga, they are a, real, a reliable force. If the international community and Iraqi government itself tries to organize the Peshmerga as a real symmetric uh, military force, then they can be a force which can uh, tackle the terrorism in Iraq, even in Syria, and for a long period of time.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, bringing us up to date to some very harsh military realities uh, in your region. Let's go to uh, Minister Pilson Bueno. Uh, I, uh, we talked a little bit yesterday and we talked about the, um, uh, the challenges con uh, related to dealing with a present conflict while at the same time planning for the near and the more long-term future. Share some of those thoughts with us, please. Well, for, first I would like to, <coughs> to comment that uh, if you look at the context of, of Colombia, uh, 15 years ago, for many experts, the country was almost called uh, a failed state. And I think the, the, the most important institutions that really help contribute to turn around the country was precisely the armed forces. Mm. Our armed forces were built up in a way that uh, were able to start protecting the people, recovering territorial control, fighting crime, the sources of violence like drug trafficking, uh, uh, kidnapping and other uh, kinds of crime. And with a very strong cooperation, uh, but uh, I would say at the same time, very low cost cooperation from the US as compared to what they have done in other parts. But uh, it really create uh, the possibility to create the environment that in which where we are right now when we did all that build up, what we wanted was at the end to bring peace to the Colombian people. What we have now is a process in which uh, the consequence of our military and police successes uh, and the degrading of terrorist organizations have allowed President Santos to lead the idea of a peace process that is credible, that hopefully is visible and in which we're moving forward. That puts me on, on, on this discussion, on the future of the military, uh, and, and our, in our case, our police, because in the Colombian case, it's in the same shop of the Ministry of Defense. So we have been planning in three different uh, avenues uh, that somehow have been, uh, you know, being planned in parallel, but uh, they are overlapping already because of uh, the way events are happening. So the first line of, of thought was, how do we plan for the present? How do we push enough, uh, first, the terrorist groups and their source of funding to put them in a position that they cannot have a different alternative than uh, going into a negotiating process? That's where we are. We haven't finished. So we need to keep uh, the pace, we need to keep the success, and we need to keep especially giving confidence to the people and to the investors that have come to the country, that have turned around the economy, that have created jobs in order to really move forward. So that's our, our, our first effort. Second, most of the Colombian people is asking these days, not anymore for protection against a war, which is now happening just in 9% of the, of the total territory, as compared to 50% 15 years ago. Uh, but people is asking now for the same things people will ask in any city of the world. Uh, street crime protection. Mm. I mean, they want to feel secure. So we have been able in this initiative of the present to launch a, a street crime or what we call a citizen security policy in order to strengthen the national police, strengthen uh, security tools, uh, technology, cameras, and other uh, capabilities, even the Attorney General Office, to really offer the people now this new level of security that they're asking. Then we have a second line of planning. So it's what we call transition. The question is, if we sign a peace agreement and we keep pushing for that, and that's the national strategy as we speak, what is important is that the day after, we really have a plan that guarantees a very orderly process of demobilization, disarmament, reintegration, and at the same time, tackling other issues like even the security of those who are uh, demobilizing and other types of uh, efforts uh, related. We create a, a joint command uh, led by a four-star general that is dedicated with an interagency uh, and 
as I said, joint effort with the other services to plan on this and to be part even of the uh, ending phase of the negotiation as long as uh, we're able to get there. So I, I think that's another important signal. And finally, we have a third line of planning, which is thinking for the future. How are we going to shape the armed forces uh, for, for, for what comes next? So first of all, we have to look at this on, on two uh, visions. One, our internal uh, issues, and second, how can we contribute to uh, peace and stability in a region and in the world as a major uh, interest? So when we think internally, the first challenge we will have is to tackle those crimes that will still continue uh, beyond the peace process. I mean, drug trafficking, criminal mining, extortion will just not vanish. Mm. It might continue there. So we will have to guarantee that we have the national police and the armed forces that can tackle that depending on the regions, depending on how we do things. Second, there is a major issue for a country like Colombia. Uh, Colombia, and in general terms, Latin America, particularly Andean countries, Brazil, we are uh, very well endowed with natural resources, with sources of water, and with uh, 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 biodiversity, in general terms. Those three things might appear one of the things that are more valuable if you think 50 years from now starting even now. So we have to plan our armed forces to become more environmental friendly, if I can put it that way, and to really be close to this national endowment that is very important for our future and certainly for the future of our people. Then, strengthening national police. That is critical. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, That's what we see for the future. If we were able to get here, the only thing we cannot do is weaken the armed forces, weaken the national police. On the contrary, is strengthening these capabilities, considering uh, budgetary constraints, but is strengthening these capabilities what will offer uh, that uh, sustainability of, of peace. Certainly border control. I mean, we have been for a long time not providing that kind of border control, and that has allowed for smuggling, weapons, drug trafficking and other uh, situations. So we have to uh, look how to do that. And finally, uh, is our international approach. What we <coughs> see in our case is that we never wanted the experience we have, but we now have it. You know? And suddenly, when we come to these international discussions, appears that one of the most important challenges everybody's facing is what you might call irregular warfare or asymmetric threats. Mm. Well, that's what we learned to, uh, to do somehow. So that experience is already being offered to the world by different ways. First, we have been training in the past uh, five years 18,000 police and military out of 63 nations. Most of them, cer certainly from our region, Central America, the Caribbean, and, and other parts. So that's a way to contribute to, to, to stability. And on the other side, we have been signing agreements with the, the European Union. Next week, we will sign agreement with, Na with United Nations for uh, peace missions and uh, that kind of cooperation. My impression, our impression after this study, because this is a consequence of a, a large analysis we're involved in, is that uh, in the coming future, even today, no nation, mm. and I would say even the US, can tackle problems alone. So cooperation is the, is, is the issue, is the way of doing things. And certainly peace and stability in the world is a matter of importance for a country like Colombia, certainly for its own internal peace, certainly for what is required, I think, among uh, nations. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Let's uh, move to Professor Nye, who I also mentioned had been a key policymaker, Assistant Secretary of Defense in the biggest armed forces in the world. Uh, but still an armed force that has to make choices because being big doesn't mean that you don't have to make some serious choices. If you were asked by the president uh, right now to say what are the main issues for the U.S. military of the future, where would you start? Well, I think the hardest thing for a large country military like the U.S. is for the military to ask what kind of war are we planning for? And, uh, you know, if there, we go in cycles of 
conventional beliefs of what the next war, there will never be another Iraq, there will never be another Vietnam, so on and so forth. The answer is we don't know, and we're often wrong when we make these predictions. 20 years ago, I, remember, I think it was a British general who said, we're now fighting fourth generation warfare. He was commanding in Bosnia. He said, it's war among the peoples. It's not large military units confronting each other. It's war among the people. Well, you might say we're really in a fifth generation warfare. It's almost war without people. Drones, cyber, you know, where are the people? Uh, not near the battlefront. And we are also- the receiving end of the drones. Though. Well, then the yeah. receiving end. It's, and somebody has to push the button, but, uh, but it's a very different concept than Napoleon getting his phalanxes in the right uh, positions. And uh, we talk now about hybrid warfare, which is if you look at Gaza in 2006 or Ukraine today, it's really a mixture of, of covert military units with political units struggling to control the message. So you're mixing your propaganda with your, your fighting in ways in which you're trying to accomplish what, uh, uh, what your real objective is, is a political objective. And how you mix the, the battling with the propaganda is, uh, is, is so. So the, the short answer then is if you ask, uh, if the president says, I have to cut my defense budget, or I you know, want to save money, what do I do? Uh, don't make the mistake we made after Vietnam, where we deliberately unlearned the lessons of counterinsurgency. I'm not in favor of COIND, but I'm just saying to think that you will never need it again would be a grave mistake. You do have to basically have a wide portfolio of capabilities, and particularly, <coughs> If you can't predict what kind of war you're going to be in, and you may be involved in many, you're going to have to build a portfolio which allows you to deal with a lot of contingencies which you hope you won't have to deal with. And in that sense, I think I've just written a book called Is the American Century Over It? <laughs> and uh, I think my answer is no, and I think American military power will be preeminent uh, for quite some time but it only will be preeminent if you learn how to use it with other instruments mm. and don't make the mistake of thinking you know what the shape of future war is. So a good military planner <laughs> has to have a very broad horizon. Thank you very much, Professor Nye. Let's go to Ambassador Ischinger. Uh, two weeks you'll have the Munich Security Conference and, and you've had that now for 50 plus years, I think. Uh, not you personally, but the conference has been there. Um, and uh, which means, of course, the main issues of the day are always debated. Can you help us with extracting some of the mega trends when it comes to how conflict is evolving and how the battlefield is changing? Well, Espen, you, you made the most important point at the beginning and, and I think Professor Nye just um, underlined that also. The difficulty is to predict what's going to happen next. Mm. A year ago today, as you were conducting this conference and as we were in the last stages of preparing Munich, not one person, and I was talking to many, some here in this room, not one person in mid-January of last year told me that I should stage the debate about Ukraine as a debate about the failure, the breakdown of European security. Mm. Uh, everybody said, let's have, let's have some of these actors from Ukraine, uh, you know, Klitschko and hopefully some of the rebels. Um, this, is a this is a conflict in Ukraine. This was a year ago. Now it is a a European conflict, maybe even a, a global challenge. And the same, of course, is true with the so-called Islamic State, etc. In other words, uh, we have no choice. Professor Knight just made the point. Our militaries have to be prepared for all sorts of contingencies. We cannot only uh, prepare for territorial defense. For a while, some of us in Europe thought that was over completely. Now we are rediscovering that uh, the, the core task of NATO should still be an important part of our agenda. But again, not the only one. We also need to prepare for the kinds of modern variants like hybrid warfare, insurgency uh, situations, etc. Now, 
if it is true that most of the conflicts that we will be looking at will tend to be more conflicts within countries mm -hmm. than classic conflicts between state A and state B trying to send tank armies against each other, then uh, it's going to be generally more difficult than in the past to end a conflict. Mm. World War II in Europe was ended by the Nazis surrendering and the Allies occupying. And that was that. That definitely ended that war. Uh, ending a war like the one you are engaged in, yeah. I believe is much harder because you're not likely to have a, some kind of official surrender. So the question of how you can create a sustainable, lasting political solution in these difficult circumstances is, uh, I think, the big challenge. Mm. What does that require? It requires that our militaries uh, need to be trained uh, highly intelligently. They need to understand the environment. They need to be engaged in either they themselves or with other parts of our uh, institutions in uh, civil elements, uh, reconstruction, nation building. Um, I don't want to go be too long here, but uh, you know, in Europe, we believed and we continue to believe in deterrence as a major instrument of preventing conflict. When I look at some of these conflicts in the Middle East and elsewhere, maybe preventive nation building to prevent countries from becoming failed states, uh, to prevent countries from being so weak that they cannot uh, deal with insurgent groups uh, is also important. In other words, these, these non-military aspects of post-conflict rehabilitation, nation building, and pre-conflict preventive um, financial, political, social, and other methods of, of of soft intervention are also very important. Let me make one final <coughs> point. In Europe, for the 28 members of the European Union, the future of the military uh, will not work, will not produce meaningful results unless we are willing to make concessions on the principle of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. We need to accept the fact that if we keep lowering our defense budgets, the only way to have capable fighting forces is if we pool and share. And effectively pooling and sharing means that you're going to have to rely on your ally, that he will be with you. In other words, that you have joint decision making. Uh, and that's a hard thing to do. So for, for, for the 28 members of the European Union, pooling and sharing and discussing the question how we can move into a more joint decision-making apparatus, uh, respecting our parliamentary caveats and prerogatives, that's really a huge political task for coming years. Thank you, uh, Wolfgang. Um, as Vice Admiral said, um, I think the message from the panel so far to you representing the soldiers and sailors is that we wanted to be best at everything at the same time. Uh, in, in, back in the Cold War, war, we were happy as long as you were deterring Third World War. Uh, that was kind of easy and it worked. And then we asked you to do OOTW, which was operations older than war, or which some American soldiers said operations older than what I signed up for. Uh, and now I think you have to do a little bit of both. How does that look from your perspective? I, I think I would contest the, uh, the argument. I think we have always been expected to deal with whatever card was put on the table at, uh, at any time in history. And uh, as has already been pointed out, our ability to predict what may be coming with a high degree of accuracy is, uh, is, is uh, almost 100% imperfect. So uh, <laughs> our, we do need to be able to, to prepare forces that are, that are able to deal with a wide range. The, the, the types of adversaries, I think we're all in agreement, um, spans the, the range of um, nation states uh, engaged in conventional nation-on-nation -nation, uh, combat operations. Uh, it could be nation states engaged in hybrid or proxy warfare, employing uh, uh, either uh, direct uh, proxies or sometimes employing the, the services of 
uh, transnational organized criminal networks, uh, and we also have to deal with, uh, with uh, the, the phenomena of uh, heavily ideologically motivated terrorist networks. Mm -hmm. And so in order to deal with that, uh, that wide range of contingencies, uh, modern militaries will have to retain the ability to engage in uh, high-end nation-state war-on-war, state-on-state warfare, uh, for two reasons, principally. One, if you retain that capability, that serves as a strong deterrent of nations uh, perhaps miscalculating or engaging in, uh, uh, in dangerous activities that could lead to that kind of a conflict. Secondly, if you purport to be a, uh, an exporter of security, an exporter of the ability to train and equip other countries, you have to show that you are proficient in, in that type of warfare. So we place a high priority on regardless of the, the degree of technology that is employed and the regardless of the uh, advanced futuri futuristic types of concepts, uh, small unit infantry tactics, uh, the, the dirty, uh, bloody, difficult end of the business, you have to prove that you can master or, or you won't be effective. Uh, but I think as we look to the future, and particularly as we look to the development of military leaders, uh, we have discovered that uh, we must make sure that we, we develop the kind of leaders that have the intellectual agility uh, and certainly the, uh, the flexibility of doctrine and of, uh, of procedures to be able to work uh, not just with other military services, uh, that, uh, that was the big argument 30 years ago, but to be able to work very, very effectively with the full spectrum of the uh, national security enterprise. So that means military forces being able to communicate effectively and understand and work with law enforcement organizations, intelligence organizations, professional diplomats, uh, as well as in, in many instances, non-governmental organizations that we find all around the world. So it is a, uh, it is a, it's a difficult challenge, but, but we have found over the last 10 years uh, that we have been able to blend those kinds of capabilities into very effective networks that we can lay down on top of these adversary networks uh, that we can work very, very closely with international partners who also have developed a, a high degree of expertise, uh, as is the case with Colombia, uh, that we are able to, um, to, in some instances, and with some countries, help them as they try to develop the, um, the synapses between their interagency organizations to try and build the trust between uh, law enforcement and intelligence community and the, uh, and the military. So uh, that's where we're going. That's the direction that we need to, to go because, as has already been pointed out, uh, with today's uh, global security challenges, there is no single country in the world that is able to deal with these challenges individually in isolation. We all uh, have recognized this a long time ago and, and uh, placed great uh, um, uh, importance on the ability to work uh, effectively with partners. Which was also a major theme in the State of the Union address from President uh, Obama. Um, are, you, are you actively trying to learn the lessons from, for instance, Colombia or, or the Peshmerga? I, I would say we, um, we have been learning the lessons mm -hmm. and we've been working very closely with Colombia and uh, we, uh, we share uh, a, a rich history of working together. And I would say in, in today's era, we are learning as much or more from Colombia as perhaps we might have taught in the past. So uh, it is, uh, it, it, they are uh, a, an excellent exporter of security, both within the region and as uh, Minister Pinzon has, has pointed out, into West Africa and other places. So it's a, it's one a of the good partnership. Sorry, one of the thorny questions that uh, defense ministers uh, in I think every country in the world struggles with, I've tried that myself in my own tenure, is uh, how do you make the long-term investment decisions given that the world changes as much as we just heard in one year because if you particularly if you're a smaller country but even for the US uh, you will have it sometimes you have to make a choice do you want to invest in a new frigate or a su submarine or do you want more, more light special forces and of course the you know your preferred answer is both but if you have to make a choice how do you know because the lead time is many years it takes many many years to build this equipment and take years to train people to do it to run it, and then you will have it for 40 years until you have to decide whether you want to do it again or not. How do you make these decisions in such a volatile world? Open question. One of the vice, on the uh, of the threat. <laughs> a former vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff once said, platforms are not what you focus on. Your platforms will 
be around, but what's on the platforms, the information systems, those are gonna change very rapidly. So invest in platforms which you can adapt and adapt quickly. So you know, the B-52 has been around longer than Davos, uh, but the B-52 today is not the B-52 of the 1960s. The same thing as you think of aircraft. Because it's an innovator just like that was. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> it was. It's the continual change, but the continual application of information technology systems. So don't focus too much on the platform. Focus instead on the ability to keep adapting the platform. Um, should we open the floor for a quick question? It must be a quick question. We have very few minutes. Uh, but before I do that, just as a teaser, the next panel in this very room just after this is on the future of intelligence services. And as I think there's some overlap in interest, you, you may want to stay so you can come back to this in the next panel. But for the military, the first question is here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Farid Yassin. I'm the Iraqi ambassador to France, which puts me in an interesting point of perspective. Um, there is much more to the military than fighting. The military as an institution is in many countries a force for social cohesion. Mm -hmm. And that's a point that's being raised by many countries, including my own, and including France, where I currently reside, uh, because we've seen lots of people uh, take a tangent and go off and become uh, deadly insurgents elsewhere. And there is debate now in France, as there is in Iraq, about uh, reintroducing conscription uh, as a measure uh, of uh, social cohesion, to ensure social cohesion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I note that we're in Switzerland, which is the country par excellence of the citizen's army, uh, and it's exemplary in its social cohesion. So my question to the panel is, uh, what role do you see for the future military in terms of implementing, ensuring social cohesion of countries? And would, do you think conscription play a role in an ever increasingly specialized forces. Thank you. Great question. Uh, please call, we will collect a few so the audience has a chance and, and, uh, and Nari Woods will have the floor in a second. But, but I just want to recognize the presence of the Chief of Defense of Switzerland and thank him for his uh, troops actually making it possible for us to be here. And those, the people who are protecting the outer perimeter are actually largely conscripts. So that's part of the answer to your question, I guess. Over here. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, I'm Amanda Ellis, the Amanda. New Zealand ambassador to the UN in Geneva. You mentioned the importance of working with a range of actors, including international diplomats. For those of us who are now on the Security Council, tell us what we can be doing to support you helping create a safer world. Okay, one more question. I can't see. Yeah, right behind me. Gideon Rose. Gideon Rose, editor of Foreign Affairs. Uh, in the last year, we've seen uh, Russia invade Crimea, the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, and Western sanctions applied in response. Taken as a whole, has this experience undermined norms about the use of force to, uh, in aggression or reinforced them? Great question. Thank you, Gideon. OK, I'll have one more if there's somebody. General, want to? No? OK, let's go back to the panel. Um, yeah, there was one. You're the last. You have it. Right there. Thank you. Noah Barkin at Reuters, based in Berlin. I have a question for Mr. Ischinger. A year ago at the Munich Security Conference, we had heard speeches from the German president, uh, the German defense minister, German foreign minister, uh, calling for a more active German foreign policy, a more muscular foreign policy. Um, where are we a year later after Ukraine the arming of the Kurds in, in Iraq. Okay, great. Thank you for those questions. Uh, yeah, why don't we start with this, uh, Ambassador Ishinga? Uh, okay, thank you. Thank, thanks for the question. Um, well, there's good news and there's bad news. The bad news is that we have just released, actually, yesterday, the results of a poll taken in Germany of to what extent Germans would support a more proactive, including more militarily proactive foreign policy. The result is not entirely 
uh, that it does not lead to great euphoria. In other words, Germans r apparently remain rather skeptical. Um, at the same time, that's the good news, um, I think the debate in Munich last year started not only a broad discussion in Germany, it led to certain decisions and, be, and to certain um, policies which without the start of this debate would not have happened. One is the delivery of, of certain types of weapons to the Peshmerga, totally impossible to imagine a year ago. Second, uh, the kind of, and I put it in quotes, in quotation marks, the kind of leadership role which uh, Chancellor Merkel and, and our foreign minister have had to assume more or less in terms of how to deal with um, our Russian counterparts on the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, I think that is something which has been encouraged by this debate. So in other words, I think things have changed. Some of you may feel they haven't changed enough, but I think things are changing in the right direction. Great questions on uh, social cohesion uh, as created by the military. You talked about the, you know, the role of the military in taking a nation ahead, not only security, I think, was what you mentioned, but, but, and, and the issue of conscript. Who want to go in? I, and more? I think um, it, we recognize uh, historically uh, there have been uh, very, very important roles played by militaries uh, in the role of social cohesion. Uh, the challenge that you will always run into is there is, there is going to be a tension uh, among the professional military, I suspect they will always prefer to have a professional military that can be highly trained, uh, that has a, a degree of um, commitment to the mission that, that perhaps may be greater. Uh, and perhaps uh, national leaders may find it easier to use professional militaries uh, because uh, they won't be, uh, there won't be uh, constrictions placed on where those military forces can be deployed to or how they may be employed. Uh, so so there's, there's going to be more flexibility. Uh, but that's not to say that there's not an important role to be played. And I think we all recognize that uh, the more members of certainly a democracy uh, understand exactly what is at stake, exactly what the price to be paid for enjoying the types of uh, freedoms and liberties that we enjoy, uh, the, the stronger the democracy will be. So it's a tension. We have exactly three more minutes and uh, three uh, uh, more speakers to... to Come with their common final comment. Can I give a Perfect. one minute answer then to Gideon's uh, question mm -hmm. about uh, norms? If there had been no response to the taking of a neighbor's territory by force, mm -hmm. which profoundly violates the 1945 settlement, then I think the norm would have been damaged. Mm -hmm. The fact that we've had sanctions, the fact that they're having an effect, I mean, oil price makes some important difference, but even before that, Putin was being cut off from the sources of Western technology he needs for frontier oil and gas. Instead, he's becoming China's gas station, which is not where he wants to be. He's destroyed the prospects for his Eurasian Union, and he's done something which we couldn't do if we tried, which is solidified NATO, as we saw at Wales. Yeah. So if you ask, is this man a brilliant tech strategist? No. He's a disastrous strategist. He's a brilliant tactician, but his tactics have included, uh, unsuspectingly, reinforcement of the 1945 norm rather than destruction of it. And just a very quick 10 seconds on the UN Security Council, never underestimate the importance of the United Nations peacekeeping forces. They're not perfect. They have all sorts of problems. But when the world gets into a mess in some area and can't figure it out, the presence of UN peacekeepers is extraordinarily important. Thank you very much for that. Um, before I give the floor to Pinson Warner, I just want to point out that in your answer, which I think is a good answer to that question, you also suggest one, one of the reasons why we're interested in geoeconomics, because actually the response to a military attack, if in all practical purposes, has been in the economic realm, which of course matters to the members of the World Economic Forum, because it means the return of the active use of economic instruments for strategic political means. And then we can reflect on that in future panels. Uh, Bueno. There's some final observations on things that uh, we have been doing in the present that I believe are important for the future, listening to this discussion and to the questions. First, uh, giving capabilities other than military 
to the armed forces is very important. Uh, capabilities to keep uh, uh, giving building capacity or supporting natural disasters. I think that gives mm -hmm. credibility, legitimacy, and at the same time, uh, certainly they're a platform, a logistical platform than anyone else can match, at least in a country uh, like mine, and I believe in many countries. Second, education, military education. I think that is critical. The kind of problems the world is going to confront, as Professor Nye very well described, are unexpected. You never know. But the only way you can tackle those is if you have a cadre of professionals, in this case military professionals, that are educated beyond their own uh, technical or military uh, responsibilities. So in our case right now, I have more military than ever so in, uh, in, in different universities in the world, around 60, 65 uh, officers, and we're trying to increase that. that. That's a little bit of an effort that I believe is going to be important for the future. Third, uh, understanding that we have to merge uh, the capabilities of the military and the police, and that's critical, you know, at least on asymmetric uh, uh, challenges. Uh, when you go and to try to confront the problem with a, with a military, suddenly they will find that they are fighting crime, mm. or at least sources of violence that are related to crime. So we need a military that can be effective in policing, but a, or a police that can have some kind of uh, military capabilities, at least in the short term, to, to confront issues. I'm going to have more, but uh, yeah, I mean, I time is constraining. <laughs> Sorry for uh, that. Uh, so the last minute is yes. for uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you. Very shortly, in the beginning, as we started the, the democratic process in Iraq, the main idea of the main forces of the Iraqi population was to keep the army out of the interior conflicts, to limit their, their activities in the defending the country from the threats which are coming from outside. But the, <coughs> but the crimes of the, of the terrorists since uh, 2004 or five, had turned that all over. So we were forced to, to use the army inside the country. And here is the point. Here we should think that the army shouldn't be a tool of one component in the, the interior conflicts, mm -hmm. because it is very, very high how to distinguish a, a terrorist from a, another people who have another idea or he, or who is opposing the, the policy of the government. That's why, just to keep the, the, the army in a, a, a right way inside the, 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 the country and having an effective role to tackling the, the terrorism, there should be a, a political uh, stability in the country. There should be a mutual understanding between the components of the Iraqi population on the basis of real uh, partnership and at equality. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Thank to all of you for an excellent panel. And as I said, there's no reason to leave because next panel is in quarter of an hour, Future of Intelligence Services, which will also be a very interesting panel. Thank you very much and thank you for the attention. <laughs>